afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, LifeBob and Columbia uh, spot and uh, program on uh, dialysis and transplantation. And uh, it's sponsored by Veloxis. What I would like to do is uh, start out by introducing uh, our panelists and uh, our moderators. I'm Mark Hardy. I'm uh, Alkincross Professor of Surgery and founder of the Transplantation Program at Columbia. Uh, Dr. Karen Heinberger is CEO of LifeBulb. We will act as moderators. And our panelists, distinguished panelists, are Dr. Gerald Appel, if you would raise your hand. Dr. Appel is a professor of medicine and a director of our glomerular disease uh, center. Uh, Dr. Maya Rao is uh, associate professor of medicine and she is now the director of medicine at Allen Pavilion and also director of chronic disease uh, center. And Dr. Ali Hussein is uh, assistant professor of medicine who is uh, our transplantation expert in uh, immunosuppression and uh, much of the outcome research as well as uh, daily care of transplant patients. And uh, we would like to now, uh, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Hehenberger for a few words, and then we will be able to start with the questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Hardy, and welcome everyone. We're very excited to have you uh, here today. This is our second session in our uh, year-long um, uh, seminar series. And we hope this will be continued, of course. Um, as Dr. Hardy said, we're focused on uh, transplantation, but also end-stage disease, um, kidney disease in, in particular. And uh, today we're joined by experts in, in that field. And um, the goal here is um, to uh, have a great discussion, uh, have questions from uh, our audience, being patients and care partners, because we really want to answer your questions, um, questions about living with end-stage kidney disease, how to prepare for the next step, which in many cases, dialysis, and of course, also transplantation. Um, I am, am uh, trained as a medical doctor and, uh, and a scientist, but I wanna add also that I'm also a person living with uh, chronic disease. I have gone through uh, a kidney transplant, uh, been in, in that position of living with end-stage kidney disease, so I know what it's like. Um, I've also I've gone through a pancreas transplant, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an area that I know very well from both professional and personal experience. So um, with that, I'd like to ask um, uh, the first question to uh, Dr. Appel. Um, wh when should we start considering uh, dialysis? When, when is it time for, for a patient who's been told that they're living with uh, CKD or even ESRD, end-stage renal disease, uh, that dialysis is on the horizon? Well, Karen, let me just set the stage for this. You know, if you're a patient out there and listening to this, you're not alone. 15% of all adults in the United States have chronic kidney disease. That's 37 million people, one in, out of every seven people. And close to 150,000 people started treatment for end-stage kidney disease last year in the United States. It's 150,000, huge numbers. There are something like 750,000 people now living on dialysis or with a, a, a functioning transplant. The, the most common causes, by the way, are hypertension, diabetes, and inflammation of the filters, glomerulonephritis. So that's the background. So as I said, you're not alone. One of the most common things we're faced with is, what do we tell our patients whose renal function is decreasing? When should they start dialysis? When will they need to start dialysis? Now, let me first say that 
I start talking to people about dialysis or transplantation, if you're medically oriented, when they have a creatinine of four or their GFR is 25 cc's a minute, long in advance. We don't want any surprises in this. I tell the patient, we never want you to get sick waiting for dialysis or transplantation. The earlier you do it, the smoother your transition is there. However, it's very individualized. Some people have a very progressive course and you have to prepare them right at that level. Other people that uh, you'll have plenty of time. They have a disease that's going slowly over time and you can talk to them again and again. So it's very individualized when they have to be spoken to about dialysis and transplant where they have to know about it. They certainly can read about it and learn about it early. It'll never hurt. I'm now going to turn this over to my colleagues. Uh, Maya, what, when do you start people on dialysis or when do you tell them they should start? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Appel. I completely agree. It definitely has to be individualized. The general recommendation is that you start preparing for dialysis when the kidney function is around 20% or less. Um, and that really is because we want people to have all the options in terms of home dialysis, whether they want to do dialysis in a center or not. And in order to make those different options happen, then we have to be able to plan for it. Um, in terms of when a person would actually need dialysis, you know, there's never been any study that supported that um, starting early dialysis is beneficial. So what we tend to do is really individualize that based on people's symptoms. If they're developing symptoms of kidney failure and cleaning the toxins from the blood would help them, that would be a reason to start dialysis. Um, there are other things that can happen. Potassium levels get very high that we can't control or people have a lot of fluid on their body. So those are the reasons we actually start. But again, the preparation does take quite some time. And there's a lot of decisions people have to make in terms of what fits with their lifestyle. And so in that sense, we do usually start talking about these things once the kidney function gets to about 20%. Yeah, and I'd like to add, you know, uh... Can't emphasize enough uh, what Dr. Rao and Dr. Opel said about personalization and individualization. I think a lot of people will be very focused on their level of kidney function and say, I'm very, very close or I'm very, very far, but that shouldn't uh, kind of interfere with the preparation for being ready because everyone's course will be very different. And, um, you know, uh, like Dr. Rao said, being prepared allows you to really explore all possible options for kidney failure, both in terms of home modalities, which we'll talk, I know we'll talk about soon, uh, in center modalities, and also transplant. And some people might be able to avoid dialysis altogether. Yeah. Well, well, I would just out of, out of, sorry, out of, out of curiosity, how many, uh, what percentage of patients nowadays go on transplant uh, preemptive and, and skip dialysis altogether? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's difficult to answer um, that because we don't really know the true denominator of patients who are transplant eligible. But we know that uh, among US transplant candidates, Less, just under one third probably are listed for transplants preemptively, so before starting dialysis. And uh, of all transplants that, that are performed, probably somewhere close to uh, between one and eight and one to ten, a uh, one of uh, one in ten are performed uh, preemptively. That probably means that the actual true level of patients who are transplant eligible uh, who get preemptive transplants is much lower because a lot of patients don't make it to the wait list um, or make it to the wait list very late. So I think it's a really underutilized uh, option despite being the option that provides like the best outcomes in terms of survival, quality of life, the ability to return to work uh, and cost. Hmm. So what you're all suggesting actually is that while the suggestion of dialysis comes up in the appropriate patient's suggestion of transplantation and emphasis on it uh, should be uh, really uh, placed uh, relatively heavily in order to try to avoid dialysis, if at all possible. Absolutely. Is that being done? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Because when I said I talk to the people, remember, it's not just about dialysis when they're at that level, which is a little above the level that Maya suggested. I'm a little bit earlier than that, 25 cc's a minute or creatinine four. But regardless, I talk to them about transplant too. And at the same time, the first thing I ask is, do you have potential donors? You know. Uh, you know, whether they have a living related or living unrelated potential donor, and that workup has to go on. They may think they have a donor, but they may not. If that's the case, then getting them listed as soon as possible is important. 
So, so I talked to them about transplant at the same time I first mentioned the, the question of dialysis. And, and we, may we just continue then, while you're talking about dialysis, uh, do you discuss the issue of what type of dialysis they can have and whether one is preferable over another? And uh, all the questions about access and getting it done and I may as well add, and when should they have it done? Let's start backward, perhaps. Let's start with Ali first. Sure. Uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, and, and I think the answer is basically yes to everything. I think kind of talking about all of those options is important because you know there's no clear evidence that any of those modalities is better than any of the others, um, but they offer a lot of very different benefits and downsides. So kind of being able to explore all of the different possibilities allows someone to find the fit that's best for them. So for example, some people uh, who we take care of just say, you know, I don't really like to be very hands-on in my kind of treatment types. I'd rather show up to a center and have the treatment done to me and leave and that's it, right? And that decision is very easy that, that, that in-center hemodialysis might be best for them. But some people say, you know, I like to live a very active lifestyle. I like to travel a lot. I like to travel internationally. I have very long work hours. Uh, I'm not able to reliably attend an in-center. A session, you know, uh, and there's multiple different options for home modalities from hemodialysis at home to peritoneal dialysis um, that can uh, kind of be discussed. And again, uh, kind of, I know we're kind of repeating the same themes over and over again, but, but uh, having adequate preparation ahead of time allows you to start with your preferred modality. And I think a big place where we go wrong as a nephrology community is that a lot of people end up starting by default, uh, the vast majority of Americans actually, on in center hemodialysis, even though if you kind of pull people on what they would like to be on, uh, it's largely not in center hemodialysis, and I kind of that's just a product of poor preparation. And you know, even beyond that, you know, not everyone needs the same initial dialysis treatment. Some can need to start with three times a week dialysis. Many people can start with twice week twice weekly dialysis. And kind of, there's so many options that it's important to talk about all of these things um, uh, with uh, the provider well in advance of the initiation. So, Dr. Hussein, just for our audience, um, I, their education. Uh, the difference between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Um, can you just briefly distinguish between those two? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, you know, dialysis in general, as you think about as um, kind of uh, artificial replacement of part of the kidney's function, which is the, the function of cleaning the blood. Uh, you know, the kidneys, each kidney has about a million filters in it, and basically blood flows through those filters every second of every day uh, and removes toxins and holds on to things you need, like salt and water and um, some other electrolytes. Um, so in dialysis, uh, we can either uh, do hemodialysis, which is when blood is removed from the body, passes through a machine, and then kind of the clean blood is returned back to the body. Um, uh, sounds complicated, but from a patient standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Kind of they have a, a, either a needle or a kind of connection through a catheter that just takes the blood out and pulls it back into a different place. Um, so that's kind of just blood leaving the body, going to the machine, being processed and coming back. For peritoneal dialysis, we leverage the body's own um, membranes or kind of a kind of a thin film inside the abdomen to do that same cleaning process. So in, in peritoneal dialysis, rather than anything, any body fluid leaving the body, we instill some uh, kind of special fluid into the abdomen, let that cleaning happen across the body's own membrane, and then take the um, uh, fluid back out and with it, some toxins and other materials that we'd like to remove. Maya, can you add anything to this, please, in terms of uh, what you tell the patients in terms of choosing one or the other, and when you start them on, uh, uh, on getting the procedure that are necessary to do either peritoneal or hemodialysis? Yes, I mean, you know, I think as everyone's already said here, I'll just say that education is absolutely key and a patient is their own best advocate and and in a way we're trying to individualize the treatment to what their goals are and their lifestyle is you know the physician can't know that we need to hear from our patient. Um, and so. The peritoneal dialysis is such a great option because it, it allows people to have flexibility with travel and also to be home often can be done mostly at night. Um, but it requires a different type of access, you know, a way to, to uh, do the dialysis. 
Um, it's a catheter that goes into the belly, a soft catheter. And that's something that we can put in a few weeks before we start the dialysis, but there's also a training period of about two weeks. So you see why you do need some lead time. With hemodialysis, ideally we want a patient to have a shunt put into the arm, either a fistula or a graft, and that's done by a vascular surgeon. Um, a fistula can take a couple months to, um, after the surgery, when we can use it, it has to um, get big, we call it, it has to get matured. So we need even more lead time for the hemodialysis, um, ideally. So this is why early discussion is so important. And I, I'll say as somebody who takes care of lots of patients transitioning to dialysis, I think one thing I see, and it's totally understandable because this is a traumatic and difficult transition for patients, is this, this sort of denial, not wanting to face it. Um, but facing it and really understanding what your options are is the most important thing so that your doctor can kind of help you decide what's going to be the best plan, ultimately with the goal of getting a transplant always. I think that's an important point, ultimately trying to get a transplant. Uh, so, uh, you know, dialysis then, as you see it, the three of you, you see it as a, as a transition, as a bridge to transplant. But for many people, I, I would think almost a, a majority, it's not, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the rest of their lives. Yeah. J Jerry, there is a patient who asked, what does it mean when we start saying a problem? Uh. <laughs> so in other words, a problem, so your problem is when the creatinine is four and the clearance is about 25. Yes. Then, then it, it's, it's a problem. And is that the time that you start referring the patient for access for procedures or not? No, that's the time I start talking to them. As things go on, then it's the time I refer them for access or for peritoneal dialysis. When? And one difference between the peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis, most hemodialysis is now in center. Mm -hmm. A lot of there's a big tendency to try to get dialysis into the home and, and out of center right now, but still most of it's in center that uh, the peritoneal, as Maya mentioned, is usually done CCPD at night, you know, when you, and you're doing it with your partner. So you need a home facility that can equip this. I mean, you can't live in a, a shelter that uh, you need somebody else usually who's helping you out in terms of this. You need a clean environment. People need eyesight if they're doing the connections themselves. You know, a diabetic with very bad eyesight might not be a good candidate for peritoneal dialysis because of this. So there are differences that you have to choose between these in terms of, and you can help guide patients. You know, after a certain amount of time, I am sure Dr. Rao knows immediately when she's talking to the patient, is this person going to be a good person for home dialysis? Are they going to be good for peritoneal? Or would they do better being seen three times a week at a dialysis center, even if it's by a nurse or a technician? So, so there, there's, there's certainly differences that uh, um, the- uh, There aren't many, there are not many patients in the United States who, have, who are maintained on peritoneal dialysis. What is the percentage about? Maya? It's pretty low. Um, I think about 10 to 12% are on a home modality in the United States. I mean, I think it's important to point out that we are way behind or it's very different in other countries um, where often the majority of people are on these modalities. So this is something that's fairly unique to the United States. Actress, actually, interestingly, in developing nations, often this is the modality they more use because the centers require uh, so much um, investment um, and so really there's been a, a real push on the part of, of the government and nephro the nephrology community uh, to move more patients to home because we do feel that ultimately for many people, the quality of life is better um, and that there's been a lot of barriers in the United States to having home dialysis um, be more of a, an option. But I think the government's trying to do a lot to lower those barriers. And, um, you know, if, if this is what patients want, we want to be able to make it happen for them. It does require a certain degree of responsibility, a major degree of responsibility and independence on the part of the patient. It, this it, is not yeah. for someone who is squeamish and doesn't really want to take care of them, wants someone else to take care of them. Yeah, it, it's exactly like Dr. Hussein said. I mean, I think the difference is being an active participant or wanting to be more passive. But I will say this, that it is so easy to do 
it's literally connecting a catheter to a catheter. There's no blood with the peritoneal. And um, honestly, we have a lot of even elderly frail patients where they have a partner who's able to do it. We call it assisted PD. And it's a fantastic option for those kinds of patients because it's very gentle on the body. Um, and so patients like that tend to do better with peritoneal. Um, so again, I think we can make these things work for patients, but sure, they have to be willing to do it. So, so a question again, going back to, and then we're going to go back to a patient question, but <clears throat> a question between the peritoneal and the hemodialysis. Uh, um, what is the most effective? Um, you know, is peritoneal really that effective compared to hemodialysis? Yeah, I mean, there is no evidence medically to support the use of one over the other. Um, I really okay. think of it on a basic level as being about people's lifestyle decisions. And then, you know, again, the, the thing about the peritoneal is because it's done seven days a week. So, so again, a reason some patients don't like it because the in-center one is three days a week. But when you think about that, seven days a week means per unit time. The yep. dialysis is much more gentle. And yep. therefore, many people who have issues with the in-center, low blood pressure, feeling very tired after, this does a better job in terms of mitigating those symptoms. So for patients with heart failure, frail patients, um, it's a great option. And if you want to keep working, unless you work at night, unless you're a night watchman, I mean, like you're doing it at night and you can do what you want during the day, yep. if it's three times a week for hemodialysis, that's going to take three times, you know, three or four hours out of the schedule for sure, three times a week. So I what, what, one of our patients, Jerry, who asked about what is the significance of having protein in the urine initially? Yes. What, that, that's the same patient that asked, I think, about the problem. Right. So that's right. a problem. That's by the problem. So, uh, so that I, I, the problem is probably the wrong word for this. This is a, a common finding that indicates kidney disease, that if you have significant amounts of protein in the urine, it means that those filters that, were that Ali talked about before, the million filters in each kidney are leaking protein through into the urine. It's a sign of damage to the filters and the kidney. And the most common causes that of having a fair amount of protein are diabetes, hypertension, and glomerulonephritis, the three most common causes of kidney disease. So again, not all patients. Some patients will not have this. Some patients will just have some red blood cells leaking through, but the majority of the patients will have some proteinuria, and that's how people are picked up. They go to their pediatrician for a routine checkup. They have a pregnancy physical, and somebody puts a little dipstick in their urine and finds protein there. They have an insurance physical, a sports physical when they're young, and all of a sudden they picked up proteinuria, off to their internist, and then off to the nephrologist. So, in our pre go ahead. No, in our previous session, we did talk about what one can do when one uh, finds, uh, you know, oneself in that in that uh, position. Uh, and that's more of the earlier stage kidney disease and, and having proteinuria and, and what, what can we do to prevent? And is there a point of no return when the kidneys are so damaged that, that there's just a matter of time until um, you need to, to do dialysis or get a transplant? You know, I think it'd be worth uh, maybe just a comment uh, from, from because the three of you are such experts in this space. You know, what do you advise an earlier stage um, kidney disease patient to at least try to halt the disease or even maybe uh, reverse. So the question number one, what do you recommend? And, and the question number two, is there anything on the horizon that you see um, when it comes to drugs or devices that, that um, could, could help this patient group? Because it is a big problem. Well, these are findings that are suggestive or in some cases diagnostic of kidney disease, mm -hmm. but they don't tell you what type of kidney disease the patient has. If they have diabetes, there are many treatments and some newer ones now that can prevent the progression of kidney disease over time. If yep. you have glomerulonephritis, we often use immune modulating. Some of the medicines that are used later in transplant, we use to try to prevent the progression of it. If you have hypertension as the cause, treating the hypertension will make a difference. So once you have those findings, the nephrologist's job is to determine what is the cause of them, which group is it in, and for glomerulonephritis, specifically a biopsy will often help and say, look, this is what we need to do to either cure you entirely or prevent the progression. 
If you have proteinuria, don't you generally recommend a biopsy in order to identify the disease that's causing it? Okay, I don't want to monopolize this. I want my colleagues here, but you know, but it, it depends on the degree. If it's if it's less than a gram of protein or a certain amount in the urine, most people would not recommend a biopsy, but just trying to treat it non-specifically with certain blood pressure medicines, other medications, and, and slow the course, because you would not use immunosuppressives regardless of what disease it is. Now, if it's over that amount, usually a biopsy is done. That's true for the United States and most westernized countries. That, uh, on the other hand, some countries biopsy earlier. In Japan, you know, they use half the amount and they would do biopsies to diagnose what's going on. So, so it's not, it's dependent on the patient and whether they have other findings in their body that suggest arthritis or eye disease or something that suggests there's a disease where you can make a diagnosis such as lupus, amyloid, or something else by the kidney biopsy. So not everybody with proteinuria needs a biopsy. I think if patients are wondering kind of why that should matter to them, I think there's, there's a couple important things from patient level you should understand of like, you know, why, why should I care that my kidney function is low or that my high elevated protein levels in the urine? And uh, kind of uh, two big ones are that, you know, once you lose some kidney function to chronic scarring, that's typically not recoverable. So it's important to understand the cause of kidney disease early and take whatever actions and appropriate treatments can slow its decline, the kidney function's decline, because once you've lost kidney function, that, that those filters that are scarred over don't grow back. So kind of uh, the best thing you can do to prevent um, the need for dialysis, because, you know, most patients with kidney disease in the United States will never need dialysis or transplant. Kind of, it, it, it won't get to that point in their lifetime. The way to kind of achieve that is by early recognition and treatment. The second is that, you know, having low kidney function or having even just high protein in the urine without low kidney function is a risk factor for other problems like heart attack and stroke. So treating those, preventing the decline, and even just reducing the amount of protein that's abnormally leaking into the urine can actually help your overall cardiovascular health. So patients shouldn't feel like, oh, you know, I have no symptoms or the doctor's just telling me something's wrong and, and telling me to control my blood sugar, but I don't really feel anything wrong with me because kind of even though they don't feel okay, acting early can actually have a really big impact on their life years down the line. I think these are very important comments. And I'd like, I'd like to just follow up with a question maybe for Dr. Rao. Uh, you know, I think Dr. Hussain indicated that the kidney has overcapacity because if you um, re remove some of the function, you can still function. And that brings us to supply uh, for, for kidney transplant as well. So what, what, is, what do you uh, see as, first of all, for a patient who has kidney disease, what kind of, uh, we've talked about 20, 25%, um, but for a person who uh, goes through a transplantation and uh, someone gives them a kidney, what, what, is that safe? Is it safe to give up one kidney? And can that kidney take care of the rest of the body? Uh, are you asking from the standpoint of the donor, is it safe to the give donor. it? Yes. Um, so whenever, you know, and again, I'm, I'm selfish because I always want my patient to get the kidney. I'm not on the side of the transplant like Dr. Hussein. <laughs> so conflict of interest, but I always tell my patients who are worried about this, oh, I don't want my family member to donate. I, I wouldn't want them to end up with this. And, and my, what I say to them is the transplant center will never take a kidney from somebody if they feel it's unsafe. You know, their obligation first and foremost is actually to the donor. Um, and so, you know, there is absolutely extensive testing done, which I can let Dr. Hussein speak more about since he's on that side of things. Um, and a very rigorous process to make sure that the patient who is giving the kidney doesn't have any underlying kidney disease, any risk for kidney disease, and therefore they would be safe to donate the kidney um, to the recipient. I don't know if you want to add anything, Ali. Yeah, sure. I think this is a question that comes up a lot because people are very nervous, as Dr. Rao said, about asking their family members or loved ones or friends for the donation because they're worried about what will happen to them. But um, like you mentioned, you know, the body has a lot of reserve uh, in the kidney function. And if we can uh, kind of do extensive testing and uh, find a well-selected donor whose risk of kidney complications later on in life is low, the, the overall risk is really low. So we know from um, studies of US donors, international donors, just to start out with, that lifespan for donors and non-donors is the same. So we don't think it has any impact on how long you live. And then going farther out in terms of long-term effects uh, on risks of things like high blood pressure uh, or protein in the urine, those risks are probably slightly higher for donor compared to a, if they didn't donate, but overall uh, probably that effect is low. 
And it's never been shown that those actually kind of correspond to other problems that we actually care about more firmly, like a higher risk of heart attack or stroke, you know, the reasons why we care about high blood pressure. And then finally, in terms of risk of kidney complications long-term, it's also probably pretty low. So probably just over 30 out of every 10,000 donors will develop kidney failure. And probably many of them might've developed problems even if they never donated. And even that's true, even if you look at kind of really long-term data from places like um, Minnesota, where they have donors who donated 50 years ago and more, you know, most of them live uh, kind of long lives, healthy lives, a good quality of life and decent kidney function. Mm. They've, of course, been extensively tested, so they exactly. are you know, pre-selected. Well, well, one of the things I would say is that what's new in this in the last decade or so is genetic testing for all these diseases. Many of the glomerular diseases, we focal sclerosis, et cetera, we can do genetic testing and on the potential donors so that we know in terms of, you know, whether this is a genetic disease or not, which again, that's really the last decade. If you go back 15, 20 years ago, we had ways to try to do it, but it was never that good. Now it is much, much better. And this is true for polycystic kidney disease, for focal sclerosis and a lot of diseases. So genetic testing has made, I think, a, a major benefit to the potential donors and to the recipients. Right. Sorry. Dr. Rao, if, if I may ask you, since uh, you uh, have involvement with the chronic disease patients so frequently, do you, how do you feel about giving them the idea of whether dialysis or transplantation is better? What, what do you think is better uh, in the long run in terms of prevention of complications, survival, and so on? Yeah, I mean, almost for every patient, minus the small number who, um, will have a very high surgical risk or very limited life expectancy. There's absolutely no question that transplant is better. It's better for quality of life. It's better for quantity of life. Um, and so really for any patient that's eligible, our absolute goal is to get that patient a transplant. And as much as possible, dialysis is a bridge. It is true that for some patients, they won't be eligible for a transplant, but, um, Transplant is really what we want our patients to get. It's without a question, the best option. And, and how do you approach the idea, some patients come to you uh, with uh, the concept that surgery in general is dangerous. I really don't want to have it done. It yeah. is, it's, uh, it's a real problem. You can all pitch into this because this is a question that is raised frequently by a new patient who has to choose between making a decision of a preemptive transplant perhaps, or dialysis, or give it a try. Uh, isn't it true that even a short try of a year or two on dialysis has some serious uh, complications that just keep on getting worse as the dialysis continues? Yeah, I mean, I'll say from the dialysis side, we know that the long-term outcomes are not good. Um, and, and again, I think there's a lot of variability. There are many patients who do well. Patients who have diabetes tend to have worse outcomes on dialysis. Um, and therefore, you know, all the studies are very clear that those patients benefit a lot from transplant. I mean, uh, again, as somebody who takes care of a lot of dialysis patients, there are a lot of misconceptions around transplant fear. Oh, I heard of somebody who got one, it rejected, you know, everybody has this one story, but this is one of those things that is just unquestionable in medical science that transplant is beneficial to patients. So this is again, a process of education it's a process where patients who've been through a transplant can be very helpful to educate patients who are fearful. So that's that's actually a, a, a call out for help, which I think you know both to our audience and and also to our transplant life patients. Uh, you know, if you want patients to advocate for transplant to, to speak to speak to the the experience, I think you will have a lot of volunteers from this group uh, because we have a number of transplanted patients uh, who who probably would be okay speaking. No we problem. have a question from our audience. Um, and person asking the difference uh, between hemodialysis and peritoneal or in-center dialysis and at-home dialysis. One of the, the issues that sh she's read about is or seen is the, the high risk of infection in the home 
um, versus in center. Who is that true, and and how is that handled? Yeah, I mean, I think with any of these procedures, there's there's always risk of infection. I, I there there is no truth that the peritoneal is a higher risk of infection. I mean, a lot of it again depends on the type of dialysis access you have. The hemodialysis, if you have a catheter inserted, that is absolutely the highest risk of infection, and that's why we do not want patients to have that, or if they do, very limited. The fistula in the arm, the shunt, has a much lower risk of infection. Um, but the peritoneal, you know, you are taught um, really sterile technique and how to keep things clean. That's a main part of the training, actually, is, is learning how to keep everything clean, be in a clean room. And if people follow that, the risk of infection is actually exceedingly low. And, you know, if you do get an infection, you get antibiotics. But, but you know, the overall risk of infection in PD is not higher than hemodialysis. Okay, great. Um, what, do now, I, as, as far as, as uh, about transplant versus dialysis, you know, yeah. it's not, we can't ask Ali that question because he's a transplant nephrologist, but I can tell you, you know, that, uh, you know, working, you know, in nephrology uh, since the mid 1970s, Dr. Hardy's been around longer, but the mid 1970s, I have patients now who are over 40 years post-transplant. I have a fair number over 30, 35, and many, many who are over 25. I've only had one patient that I've taken care of in the, my entire experience who made it over 25 years on dialysis. And that mark was Rosetta. You may remember we had a party. Oh yes, I know her well. 25 years on dialysis. Because if you stay on dialysis, the dialysis, even though it's the best effort, we're getting better and better. It's cleaning the blood. It's, we have to provide the hormonal therapies and there are probably a thousand things we don't know that the kidney actually does that makes a difference. You just cannot match kidneys in terms of by dialysis. So if I had the choice in a family member or myself, overwhelmingly, unless there was some strong reason not to, I would opt for transplant. And I tell my patients that. I mean, if somebody is 95 years old and they have cancer and a bunch of things, they may not be a great candidate for a transplant. But, you know, for younger people, for people with glomerulonephritis, which are largely a younger group, always it's transplant. Well, I'm glad that you raised the issue of age because, uh, in fact, we do transplant patients nowadays uh, at up to the age of 80 or so if, if they have a donor. Otherwise, they may have to wait a long time, in which case they actually may not be very good candidates because uh, they already were on dialysis for five years. And that alone can cause advanced arteriosclerosis, advanced some heart disease. And uh, apropos the patient that Dr. Uh, Appel mentioned, is the woman who was on dialysis for 25 years. What he didn't say is was, was really quite amazing. The lady got shorter as time went on because the bones deteriorate on dialysis quite significantly. So she actually lost about five, six inches. But even more so, if you took an X-ray of her hand it looked like an angiogram, like they injected contrast because every single vessel was calcified. You could see the, it just, you could see the digital vessels, the ulnar and the radial artery. It looked like an angiogram where they injected dye, except there was no dye. It was calcification of the vessels over that many years. Now, in terms of, in terms of living with dialysis versus transplant. So with transplant, we'll talk another time, but with living with dialysis, so the obvious questions that come up, can I go to school with dialysis? Can I work with dialysis? Can I participate in athletics with dialysis? Uh, and what does it do to my psychological status? Uh, obviously you're sad that you're on dialysis, but otherwise uh, in terms of uh, normal life within a family setting. Uh, why don't we start with you, uh, Ali? Sure. Uh, saying? I think that uh, those are great questions. And I think those are the exact questions that uh, 
each patient needs to speak to their doctor about in terms of what their life is like in order to pick the right dialysis modality. Because really there's a dialysis modality that's right for everyone, uh, you know, depending on what they, um, or best for everyone, depending on what they want to do. So I can tell you, for example, that a, a lot of children, for example, who are school-age children might not be great candidates for intemperate hemodialysis because the schedules often interfere with their school life. Um, and a lot of very high functioning uh, kind of people who are very uh, kind of employed with very busy jobs, they might not be great for intemperate hemodialysis either. Um, because uh, the schedule is just too restrictive for them. But in terms of what you can do in dialysis, uh, you can work, you can play sports, people go on hikes, people run ma marathons, they do big bike races. Really, there's, there's nothing that you are absolutely unable to do. Just kind of finding the best way to accomplish each one of your goals by working with your team and providing the therapy that can kind of best align with those goals. You know, people, people work all kinds of different jobs on dialysis. People do all kinds of activities. They play high level sports. Um, and I think uh, another great thing to do is to talk to other others in the kidney community. And I think that's why having support groups and forums are so helpful is that, you know, I think that most kidney patients shouldn't take no for an answer. They want to really want to do something. And a doctor saying it's not possible because there's very few things that actually are not possible. Some out, some are, but, um, you know, if you say, you know, I really want to get back to hiking and your doctor's telling you, no, no, I can't, no, you can't, or I wanna, really want to travel and your doctor's telling you, you can't, you know, get a second opinion, get a third opinion. And, and this comes up all the time. I know we're not talking about transplant, but with transplant, people will be told, you know, you're not a great transplant candidate. You might be too old. Or you might be too sick. You might not have enough support. But plenty of times those patients go to get a second or third opinion at a different center, get transplanted and, and do very well. And remember that a lot of these decisions are subjective and kind of finding the doctor whose values kind of align with yours and who kind of understands what your preferences are is very, very important in making sure you can maintain that functionality. Just the, just the fact that they go and get a second or a third opinion kind of probably is a sign of self-advocacy and, uh, uh, yeah. you know, will, 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 will be a sign that they will be able to take care of themselves. So I think it they kind, of, kind of selects. Uh, you know, one thing you said that I think is important, we have heard from our patients that um, the day of dialysis and even the day after, you know, they're incredibly tired. So when you say they can do everything, um, uh, you know, I'm not talking about hemodialysis and I'm talking about in-center. Um, uh, you know, is, is that a fact? Is that something that most people uh, struggle with? Is this enormous fatigue post-transplant? I'll let, you know, my colleagues answer that as well, but certain people can do everything on dialysis, but they can do it better with a transplant. There's zero doubt in my mind. I mean, you know, if you want to run a marathon, I'm betting on the guys who have a transplant, not the guys who are on dialysis. Yep. That, uh, mm -hmm. And we've had a number of athletes that we've transplanted. Uh, Dr. Hardy transplanted Alonzo Mourning, the basketball player, who won an NBA championship playing with a kidney. Two of them. A kidney transplant. Two of them. That, uh, well, at the same time, Sean Elliott was playing in the NBA with a kidney transplant as well. So two people were playing in the NBA. Now, you know, you could never do that, you know, not at that level if you were on dialysis. And in fact, when we transplanted Alonzo, his kidney function was going out. He was running downhill at, uh, and he knew it. And that's what he said. It's time for me to get my transplant. He just called up one night and said, OK, we'll get him activated right now. So, so you can do it. The quality of life is just much better. We've had people travel all over the world. I mean, we get pictures of them skiing in the Alps, you know, leading the Mardi Gras in, in Rio. I mean, like, you know, it's amazing that, again, you could do this, some of these things with dialysis, but you could do it better with transplant. Dr. Rao, if I, if I were a woman, could I get pregnant on dialysis? Um, is it likely or not? It's, it's not likely, you know, it happens, but um, again, whether that has to do with the kidney failure itself affecting fertility or uh, the dialysis itself, and also taking a person through a pregnancy while they're on dialysis is also quite challenging. We have to um, increase the frequency of dialysis quite a bit. So it's not impossible, but it's, it's unlikely. It definitely affects fertility. If, 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 some, if a woman is in that range of Dr. Appel with a creatine clearance of about 25 and is really looking like it's, she's getting into trouble, would you recommend strongly that she not get pregnant? 
You know, I think that is a complicated question that definitely is individualized to an individual patient. I, uh, you know, chronic kidney disease itself does affect the outcomes for the fetus and also for the ability to carry a, a fetus to full term. So a person has to understand the risks. Um, but at the same time, it's difficult because if your GFR is 25, no one's going to put you on dialysis or a transplant list. So there, therefore it gets complicated in terms of whether you can wait to get a transplant and get pregnant after, which is another whole thing or not. So I, I think it's, it's a complex question, but I will say that having chronic kidney disease does affect pregnancy outcomes and outcomes for the fetus. It requires a great deal of discussion with the nephrologist and the gynecologist. Both. Yes, and coordination. <laughs> but transplant, on the other hand, is certainly, you know, for getting pregnant is not a problem. Once somebody is stable on transplant, whether you want to recommend six months, a year, two years out before, but most people would say after a year. I have a little scrapbook full of pictures of children that have been born to our, my patients and a lot of Dr. Hardy's patients after they were transplanted. It is now a full scrapbook. I mean, there are people, I have one person with three of the kids after that. I've watched a bunch of them there. I've watched the kids grow up. The kids are college age and almost adults now in terms of this with their pictures with their parents right at this time of year. I could never, you just couldn't think of that. I mean, I can think of, you know, the problems we've had, even with the patients who were on dialysis, who were just starting when they were very late and pregnant already, things like that, it's been a problem. Transplant, you know, it, it's not a major problem at all now. I, I would, I would, I would probably not say it's not a major problem. I think, I think you're, you're maybe being a little liberal there because I think it is a problem. Uh, I think most uh, uh, nephrologists or most transplant physicians would not advise uh, women to get pregnant because they would need to get off their immune suppressives uh, or at least switch them. So, and, and but we do that all the time. I do that all the time. I, I, you know, I don't know how, how many we've gone through, but you know, the, some of the ones like the calcineurin inhibitors, like cyclosporin and dacrolimus, can be used during pregnancy. Steroids yeah. can be used. Azathioprine can be used during pregnancy. So this yeah, is it's the mycophenolate. I'll ask yeah. Ali yeah. how he's done with this, but we just switch them over and just go right ahead. But Ali, what do you think? Yeah, and actually, in, in uh, yeah, yeah, I think. We would all be concerned maybe that making switches increases the risk of a complication. But if you look at um, transplant, despite those medication changes, despite the physiological changes of pregnancy, their um, their outcomes of transplant are the same as women who never got pregnant. So uh, I think that uh, everyone does get nervous. That's, that's early, a great, but... great message to give to our audience. Uh, we've had that conversation on Transplant Life and many of the young women who yeah. um, uh, have been conversing around this have been very, very frightened by their physicians. So that's that's wonderful to hear that. And I think we should try to get that data out on our platform and show it to, 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 to well, those women. It, it, it's, it's, like doctor, one... it's like Dr. Appel said previously, it, around Christmas is really great evidence for us because we've I've been transplanting for a long enough time that I'm getting these uh, Christmas wishes from my patients, usually with one or two or three children and a dog. And those Christmas cards keep on coming uh, for a long time. So it really does work pretty well. Now, it's quite true that there, there is a drug that Celsept or my, or my Fordic is probably not good for a pregnancy, but the other drugs are quite tolerable, particularly if the doses are adjusted. And it does require common sense. And uh, women should not get pregnant when they are unstable with their transplant. But it's relatively safe when they are stable. But I want to quickly come back just to the question about all of this in dialysis, just because I don't want people to feel totally hopeless if they don't have early access to a transplant, don't have access to a transplant at all. You know, Dialysis won't necessarily be totally limiting in terms of the things that you want to do in life. And coming back to this issue of fatigue, I think is a great example of why it's so important to have a good discussion with your team when you are having symptoms that are limiting, because there are often things that we can do to limit things like long dialysis recovery time, whether that's switching a modality, if it's related to the um, kind of aggressiveness of the dialysis prescription, whether it's increasing the frequency of dialysis to reduce the rate of fluid removal, 
I think that, uh, you know, it's very common and, and even things like sexual side effects, which I, I know that are common uh, issues with people <laughs> kind of, um, have uh, issues with sexual function, especially men, uh, because uh, dialysis and kidney disease uh, and heart disease kind of uh, coincide with erectile dysfunction. But kind of having frank discussions with your team about how the treatments are affecting your life and quality of life can often lead to changes in management that can improve those symptoms uh, quite a bit. Wonderful. I think that's that's fantastic. I would. Um, I, I, unfortunately, we do need to to end this uh, great discussion. We've talked about a number of subjects or, that that we uh, that, that we wanted to approach. We have not discussed all of them. Uh, there's so much more to 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 talk about. But you know, maybe a final comment from our our panel members. Uh, you know, we are approaching the holidays. Everyone is, uh, of course maybe more relaxed, but most of us are more stressed. And, uh, uh, you know, we have COVID that is increasing. Any, uh, any uh, final thoughts to our, our, our kidney patients out there? What can we do? What can we give them when it comes to hope for the future um, or, or even in existence right now? Uh, what, what's your advice for the next few weeks here over the, over the, the finish of the year and the holidays? Well, I, I think it's remarkable. In, in my lifetime, in Dr. Hardy's lifetime, we've seen transplant go from a, a small thing that where we could only do 20, 25 patients a year. And, and I'd come back from vacation and ask who was still alive. Now you can do hundreds and hundreds and you expect them to do well with transplantation and dialysis as a modality for younger people to get them through to transplantation and for some other pe older people, as Ali mentioned, you know, it's, it's a good modality. I mean, these people are alive. When you talk about, you know, 700,000, 800,000 people with dialysis or transplanted in the United States alive now and functional, it's just remarkable that uh, this, this is a small miracle. Dr. Rao, uh, I, last few I'm words. I gonna say that I actually feel quite hopeful. Um, you know, kidney disease has been underfunded and ignored, but I think the winds have really changed in our government, which funds most of the research. Um, and we didn't talk about this, but in terms of the question the patient had about proteinuria, you know, we have new drugs and these drugs show mortality benefit. They're slowing the progression of kidney disease. Um, that's exciting. We have several diabetic drugs that look like they're really slowing kidney disease down and they have a lot of benefits. So I think it's an exciting time. I think there are new drugs that we have. And there's a lot of um, active research being done in things like wearable artificial kidneys. And so I think this is a great time for the nephrology community. And Dr. Hussein. Yeah, Maya stole my points because I think she, she, hit, she hit the nail right on the head, which is that there's so much has happened in the past three years, even, you know, two new classes of drugs approved to slow the progression of kidney disease, uh, you know, uh, new research on stem cells, artificial wearable kidneys, all kinds of technology that are really going to kind of help people maintain the kidney function they do have and give them great options to replace their kidney function as it deteriorates. I think uh, kind of the future is very helpful for kidney disease. And like Dr. I think the last thing is like Dr. Bell opened with is that it's important to remember you're not alone. There's a lot of people dealing with the same thing and kind of as a community, we can really help uh, progress the quality of kidney care, uh, which is happening in a very rapid pace. Uh, well, on, that, I, on that note, I'd like to add that if you want to join a community of kidney patients and transplant patients, do go to transplantlife.com because there you can find a number of others who are similar to you. And I want to thank all the panelists for a very interesting and provocative session and would like to invite our audience to the next session in January 19th, when we will begin talking about the whole transplantation process, how we prepare patients for transplantation of dialysis. As you can see, this is a progressive type of evolution and the sessions will be monthly. The next one is January 19th at five o'clock and appropriate uh, notifications will be sent out. So thank you again. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Dr. Pell, Dr. Rao, and Dr. Hussein for a very interesting and uh, provocative session. Thank you. Thank you for having us.